Thank you, well, Alex has just left, but thank you, Chris, thank you, Alex, for, for organizing this event. <clears throat> thank you, the Law Society, for providing the venue. Uh, Peter, Daniel, thank you very much. Charles Smith for facilitating the printing of the handout. Um, <clears throat> this is a very timely uh, topic. Uh, what is whether the UK is fulfilling its role in protecting LGBT plus rights in its British and British territories? Timely, because we have a Commonwealth Head of State meeting next week here in, in London, uh, but also overdue, uh, overdue uh, in, in terms of given these arrangements, these legal arrangements that there, are, that there are between the UK and its colonial territories, uh, which have remained rather difficult to ascertain because very little is known about that. As a matter of example, uh, a senior member of the IBA, right, without his fault, actually, uh, a jurist uh, of international background, uh, unreputable. Like, I will not say his name, but uh, you say, well, they're Commonwealth countries. Uh, they have, you know, uh, their own system. Uh, and I said, no, they're not. I mean, this is precisely the point. They are not Commonwealth countries, right? And we'll talk about that briefly during the course of my presentation. Um, they are totally dependent on us, legally speaking, and we will see why that is the case. Uh, and so the ultimate responsibility lies with us. So given visibility to this puzzle, it, it, it is an overdue uh, topic. And I appreciate the law society given this opportunity to talk about that. Now, <clears throat> Pity, why don't you join us? Uh, uh, and um, so, as a matter of introduction, and I, I, I think it would be good for you to, to, to flick the pages of, of the handout, uh, just to get a better sense of what I'm trying to say here today. Um, if we go to the third slide, I'll talk about introduction here. Uh, the introduction, uh, basically, I tried to put here, uh, in one simple slide, the, the situation of the overseas territories in general, around the world. The uh, UK is not the only country with this type of colonial territories. The Netherlands, the US, France have similar arrangements. Uh, most of those countries do have them in the Caribbean, but not only there. Uh, so that's a very interesting uh, coincidence. And there are actually two aspects uh, of legal liability that overlap when it comes to these territories. One aspect of the liability that there is on the head of the motherland on the nation state that actually has power over these territories, flows towards the international community. Article 73 of the United Nations Charter is the basis of that. I'm not going to talk much about that tonight, but that, that is where you will find the main liabilities on the international law. And particularly, one aspect of it is the character of non self government territories which is a very interesting aspect because we are all the time being told when the Cayman Islands, the Bermuda, uh, breaching LGBT rights, well, we, the UK government reply is, well, you know, we support LGBT rights, but they are self-governing territories. Well, as a matter of international law, that is a lie. They are not self-governing territories. They have self-determination because we've given them self-determination, but that, that's not a way to self government why? Because they are no nation states. They are not sovereign, they are not independent, which is the main feature of being a nation state. Uh, the other liabilities therefore flows towards the population of the territories and to a certain extent to the population of the motherland, the UK people in this particular case. What policies have got the, 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 the UK in place to uh, meet this liability? Right, to make sure that this liability towards the international community and the people of the territories uh, are met. Well, they, if we look at the paper, they're actually very impressive. The FCO, the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, acknowledge this liability in its white paper, uh, accept that they have liabilities, and therefore that it has retained powers to make sure that those liabilities are complied, particularly to secure, and these are the benchmarks, right? They're written, acknowledged, and written by the FCO. The benchmark, the standard that this territory have to meet is to secure the well-being of all, of all British nationals, uh, to uh, secure just treatment and protection against abuses, and finally to secure good governance. These are the standards we have set. And in fairness to the UK, these policies uh, 
with these liabilities are the same that the Dutch, the Americans, and the French have to meet in relation to their own dependent territories in the Caribbean. So when we look, and this is simply as a footnote for comparison, uh, when we look at what they're doing, they all similarly respect the right to, to self-democratic uh, determination throughout their dependent Caribbean territories. But interestingly enough, they do not uh, permit or they do not neglect equality for anybody, uh, including LGBT people. So when same-sex marriage was brought into the Netherlands, their, non -de their dependent territories in the Caribbean, let's say Sava, Saint-Martin, some of them, uh, they ought to have to accept same-sex marriage. Uh, when the Americans uh, in, August, in, in July or June uh, 2015 uh, brought uh, the, the, the Supreme Court decided that the Constitution actually requires equal marriage, uh, the same happens in the Caribbean territories. Uh, so uh, they do comply uh, with those expressions. So the policies may be the same, and the question therefore remains what is going on at the legal level? And this is what I would like to share with you, what is going on at the legal level, whether those brilliant policies that the government, the UK government, has got in place for its territories in order to meet international liabilities and in order to meet the, the responsibility towards people of the territories are met or not. And the first thing I would like to highlight, if we move to the next slide, you, you have a fancy triangle uh, that uh, is sort of to, to explain briefly what I said at the very beginning. The British overseas territories are not part of the Commonwealth, right? The Commonwealth of Nations is that, a Commonwealth of Nations. That means uh, sovereign independent states. The British overseas territories are not part of them. And if you try to find any of the governors of the British overseas territory next week in London at the Commonwealth of Federal State meetings, you will struggle because none of them will be there even though the teams are currently participating in the Commonwealth Games. But that is the same that England participated in the final of the World Cup, right? Uh, it doesn't mean that England is a sovereign state, is a nation state. No, uh, it's part of the UK, and the UK is a nation state. So they are not part of the Commonwealth. The Commonwealth is, is a group of 53 nations. Uh, there are 38 nations with head of a state other than the monarch of the UK. There are 15 that still retain the UK crown as the sovereign head of the state. <coughs> uh, and they all together have decided that the current monarch of the UK remain on the head of the, state, of the Commonwealth. But it doesn't mean that Charles, when Elizabeth II dies, will inherit that position, right? Uh, it will be decided by consensus, by flipping a coin, whatever, God knows how, who the head of the Commonwealth will be when Elizabeth II dies. But the important thing here is that although the Crown is also the head of the British overseas territory, they are not part of the Commonwealth, right? And so what are the legal and constitutional arrangements that there are in place uh, to make sure that those liabilities are met? Of which I talked, there are two major important liabilities, towards the international community and towards the population of the territory themselves. Well, remember, they're not self-governing body. This is not because I said. I mean, if we look uh, in the references, tab one, if you open tab one of the reference, uh, you will see there uh, the United Nations uh, and the Colonization Committee of 24 non self governing territories, right? All the UK British overseas territories are there, right? So they are not self-governing. Uh, as a matter of international law, hence the responsibility of the UK towards the international community. Anything that happens in these territories, the ultimate responsibility under international law is on the head of the UK government. But anything that happens there. And hence the importance for the UK to make sure that international law is not being breached there. So what the UK has done is to devolve powers. Right? And within the devolution of powers, uh, the UK has actually also uh, given self-determination to the people of the British overseas territories in certain areas of it, but not all of them. Uh, how is this legally structured, which is what matters? Well, the fundamental piece of legislation that rules the life of people in the British overseas territory 
and rules the legality and validity of everything they do is, or surprise, uh, the Colonial Law Validity Act from 1865. If you move to tab two of the references, uh, this law is still in force and operative from the UK Parliament, and specifically give us the picture of what is the legal structure in the colonial territories. Any colonial law which is or shall be in any respect repugnant to the provisions of any act of the UK Parliament extended to the colony shall be read and subject to such act and shall, to the extent of such repugnancy, be and remain absolutely, absolutely, it's a very strong word to be used in an act of parliament, absolutely void and inoperative. That is the skeleton of the legal structure that actually operates in the British overseas territories. And if, if we want to put this in a pyramid, right, this would be at the very top of the pyramid, because under this law is that everything is free. The next step on the top of the pyramid will be the constitutional arrangements, right? But constitution with <coughs> capital C, because I'm trying to make the difference here with a small c constitutional arrangement referring to the legal structure, but constitutional uh, arrangement with capital C is the actual written code and constitution, because this is the other very important uh, corset or harness actually that has actually been placed around the British overseas territory. The, the, the first one is about the validity of what they do. But the second, the written constitution, goes one step further. It wipes away the will of the majority, right? All written constitutions in the overseas territories have got a Bill of Rights. And by effect of that Bill of Rights, uh, that is the same in any written constitution in any part of the world uh, that has got a Bill of Rights, uh, the will of the majority in relation to those substantive rights that are protected there is what is, is what to it, right? It, it, it no longer the will of the majority applies in relation to those rights. And so all written all uh, British overseas territories have got a British uh, uh, have got a constitution codified. And if you move to the next slide, which I think is very important, we need to make an important difference because in the case of Bermuda, to which I will refer uh, shortly as part of this presentation, uh, the, the, the Prime Minister of this country, of the UK, Theresa May, justified the taking away of rights of the LGBT population in Bermuda on the will of the majority. The UK respects LGBT rights, but we cannot go against the will of the majority of the British Ecology Territory. Uh, Prime Minister, I'm really sorry that the UK took away the will of the majority from Bermuda when the UK Parliament passed in 1967 what is referred to as the Bermuda Constitutional Act 1967 and set up a bit of right there. So the will of the majority doesn't work for Bermuda because the UK Parliament wish is that that shouldn't be the case. That the Westminster model, right, that we have operative in the UK and this is trying to explain of parliamentary democracy, where the, the sovereign at the top of the pyramid is the UK Parliament, whose members are elected, and hence the will of the majority in these countries always prevail. If tomorrow, I used to use this silly example in my, in my lectures at university, the UK Parliament decide to pass an act of parliament to make all the French uh, people, citizens of the UK, allowed to pay taxes, well, that will be the law. And there's nothing to challenge that act of parliament because parliament in our system is supreme. There's nothing binding parliament to do something or not to do something. Uh, there is no codification. Uh, whilst in the British overseas territory, we have a written constitution because we, the UK, have written the constitution and imposed that constitution, <coughs> have told it exactly as any written constitution does, what the legislature can do, what the judiciary can do, what the executive can do, and if they go against the constitution, that's a breach of the UK Parliament Act, right? Because the constitution in Bermuda is a UK Parliament Act. And on top of that, anything they do that breaches their constitution, being a UK Parliament Act, it is in breach of the law colonial, uh, the Colonial Validity Act, 1865. But because in 1865, the UK Parliament decided that anything that is done at the colonial level legal system 
that actually breached a, 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 a law of the UK Parliament is absolutely void and reported. Right? So that, that is the legal structure that we have got in our British overseas territory. Underneath that, underneath in that pyramid, then yes, we have the local legislation, and the, the self-determination applies, provide that the imperial laws, the constitution, and the global aid is like 65 are not being breached. Right? Within that parameter, uh, that is where they can work with the self-determination. Uh, the, the British overseas territories. So, has the UK ever taken away devolution? Is devolution permanent? Of course it is not. Uh, and it's not just a matter of law, it could be also a matter of policy. At the point in which the British overseas territories do not meet the benchmark, the standards that we talk about in the first slide, you know, the well-being of the, of the, of the British national, uh, just treatment or abusing part of the, of, of the society, or just Poor governance, you know, against the idea of good governance for the territories, the UK could technically step in and take away the devolution. Has it done that? Of course it has. Uh, if we move to the next slide, you will see the cancellation of devolution, right? Uh, it has done in 1991, ordering council to repeal the penalty. The Caribbean British overseas territories were very happy with corporal punishment and death penalty, did not want to let that go, uh, and hence the UK stepped in with an order in council. In 2000, an uh, order in council to repeal the sodomy laws, uh, the uh, British overseas territories in the Caribbean were very happy with criminalizing homosexuality, uh, keeping the gays in jail. Uh, they did not want the, that, that to be repealed, the British government stepped in. Uh, by ordering council and uh, basically took away self-determination in that particular area of criminal law. Uh, has it gone even broader than just taking away the uh, self-determination in, in one particular area of law? Yes, it has. In as recent as 2009, that a ruling in Turks and Caicos. Uh, the British government came to the conclusion that good governance was no longer possible in that territory and basically stepped in, deposed the whole government and took control for a few months until restore the ruling in terms of cases. Uh, 2015, even more recent, we had David Cameron threatening with an order in council uh, to ensure compliance with international tax law and information exchange. The British overseas territory were very happy keeping the, 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 the shareholders of the company secret and not sharing that information with anybody. So David Cameron, our point prime minister, said, well, either you do it or we do it for you. So you choose. And they did something intermediate as a matter of political compromise. In an area of law I would like to highlight, as you will all be aware with me, tax, which there's no agreement in the world. I mean, we in Europe still have Luxembourg, elections time, Monaco. Uh, so it's not that our, our overseas territories are, are, are the only crooks in the world. I mean, we do have it here at doorsteps in Europe. So uh, an area without agreement, the government was prepared to step in, take away the evolution, take away some of the tremendous and legislate for them. Uh, so you would, you would have thought that they would be prepared to do the same with human rights, right? Where there is a universal agreement, particular discrimination on grounds of LGBT. So what has the British government, who now we know that is responsible, uh, and uh, by law, uh, by its own making, by its own structure, but also under international law and the United Nations Charter, what has the, the UK government done uh, in, in LGBT matters? Uh, and so here's where I would like to move with the examples. Uh, there are basically uh, three cases I would like briefly. I'm going to extremely short in my time. Day. I can't yeah. do it. Yeah, nice. <laughs> uh, uh, there are three, uh, three cases that I would like to share very quickly with you. The first one uh, is Cayman Islands, a member, a member of the Legislative Assembly. At that time, he was deputy chairman of the Legislative Assembly, local parliament. Uh, inciting to sexual hatred and violence against LGBT people. Mr. Anthony Eden uh, took the floor of the assembly on the 14th of August 2015 uh, to defend marriage from the gays. And uh, so, I mean, I was responsible for, for him to do it. Anyway, <laughs> that's another story. And, um, and so, he said, he basically gave a 45 minutes speech, 
basically a full of vitriolic and you know, derogatories and criminal statements being said. I would like to share with you three of them, just to give you a flavor of that. The reference is a uh, reference three. If you move to uh, the, the second page of reference three, the second column, uh, he said, the next step, next step from Central Union, right? <coughs> Bestiality. Yes, it is now reported that increasing numbers of people in Germany, and I understand Mexico also, and all the countries are practicing bestiality and are offended that people would dare stop them from making love to their own animals. If you move to the next page, he said also, uh, the first column, behavior once frowned upon and punished, lying, stealing, fornication, adultery, and divorce are now promoted as normal. In the last few years, political leaders, secular academics, and liberal theologians, aided by the media, have actively promoted the acceptance of homosexuality and same-sex marriage, practices that the Bible has long, the Bible, sorry, mm -hmm. has long labeled evil and abomination to God. And he continues, sadly, what is really historic, Madam Speaker, about our modern era, is that the behavior for thousands of years was understood as a social and moral evil, a pervasion, an abomination in God's sight. is now promoted not only as normal behavior, but as something everyone should accept as good. And the last example, because I think this is the icing of the cake, and not because that's the only thing he said, is in the last page of the reference tree, the first column, in, in, in relation to same-sex marriage being adopted by the US Supreme Court. How can this be happening in America? How does child molesting become man-boy love, comparing same-sex union with pedophilia? How does crushing a baby's skull and sucking out his brains become a constitutional right? Uh, the, not surprisingly, the Cayman Island Human Rights Commission, five days after this became public, issued a public statement uh, requesting uh, the government uh, to condemn this work. But also, if you go to reference four, uh, tab four in the references, uh, the first page at the bottom, you will see there that the Cayman Island Human Rights Commission highlight the obvious, that had this statement been made outside the privilege provided by the Legislative Assembly, it is quite likely that they could have constituted the commission of a criminal offense contrary to section 88B of the Penal Code of the Cayman Islands. Uh, if you turn the page, the point three is where the chairman of the commission requests the government to condemn the statement made in the legislature in the strongest possible terms. Coincidentally, nine days after this was made public, and just two weeks after the statements were made, the then acting uh, British, uh, Minister for Overseas Territory of the UK government uh, Mr. Grant Chaps was visiting the Cayman Islands. Uh, he said absolutely nothing about this. Absolutely nothing. So this is an example of the UK just ignoring what is going on. And this is not only about same-sex unions, right, guys? I mean, I, I think we need to, 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 to be, be clear. This is a criminal offense, right? Someone is using parliamentary privilege to protect himself from being prosecuted or arrested, but this is a criminal offense is inciting to hatred and sexual violence against LGBT people. And that a minister of this government that has responsibility uh, for, for the world and the international law and towards the local population said absolutely nothing about that, regardless of the Cayman Island Human Rights Commission making this statement just nine days before his visit, I think it, it tells a lot about how those policies are actually enforced by the UK government and the FCO in particular. The next example is the misleading of Parliament. Uh, briefly, I just want to, to refer to you because this was the same year in December. If you look at tab uh, <coughs> five, the second page, uh, you will see there that the then Minister for Overseas Territories, James Dutridge, is asked in Parliament here on the 3rd of December 2015 what is going on with LGBT rights in the, in the overseas territory by one of his mates for the, from the Conservative Party? 
Uh, and his answer is, if you read the first two lines, I thank the chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee for raising this issue. Progress has been made. He mentioned the Cayman Islands, and only this week the Premier reported that the Parliament on their recognizing equal marriage, which is a great step forward. Recognizing equal marriage, what on earth have I been missing? I've been heard looking at the wrong channel all this time. So I, I want to see what actually had said the Premier to his uh, local parliament. And if we look at tab six, the second page, you will there see exactly what the Premier said about equal marriage. The second page, first column, he said, I do believe and I do hope that if we are able to make suitable amendments to our immigration regulations, we may avert the pressure to formally recognize same-sex unions and also avoid the possibility of being forced to do so by the UK Ordinary Council. Avert and avoid same-sex unions. He doesn't even dare to say marriage. I mean, if you read the whole speech, he doesn't even dare to use the word marriage. And he used avert, so there's a big difference between avert and avoid marriage or same-sex unions, with on the way to recognizing same-sex marriage. Well, would have thought, well, the poor James Davidge may have actually been misled by this chap, right? I mean, you never know, right? If he was here in London, he might have told him, yeah, I said this to, to, to Parliament, don't worry, we're going to take care of this rust which uh, we're going to do what he wants. Uh, so, but sadly, no, he was not actually misled by him. If you go to tab seven, uh, James Dudridge himself wrote the same day he said to the UK Parliament, the 3rd of December 2015, on the same day he wrote to my MP, Helen Grant, to report to her what the Premier had said in the word of the Premier. So at the very least, and you can read just the last part by yourself, at the very least, James Dudridge was actually misreporting the, uh, or misrepresenting uh, to the UK Parliament on the 3rd of December, I would argue that he was actually the president. There, there is no way, knowing what he said, and writing to my MP on the same day, that the same day he would actually say something so obviously different to the House of Commons in reply to a question being put forward to him. Uh, the third example is collusion. I'm not going to talk much about this, uh, so don't worry. Uh, simply just to show that from doing nothing, from misleading, the UK now is colluding in the breach of LGBT rights. The case is the Bermuda case, the UK disregard of the rule of law and complicity in segregating LGBT people. Uh, th the matter is very serious in that in this particular case, uh, I mean briefly for those who are not aware, uh, the, the, the first instance court in Bermuda, which is referred to as Supreme Court, Really, uh, actually have uh, found, as a matter of Bermuda law, right? the court only interpret in its judgment Bermuda law. It doesn't touch upon the constitution of Bermuda, which is an act of the UK Parliament. It does not touch upon international law, the European Convention on Human Rights, which are, is binding for the Bermuda government. It just simply interpreted Bermuda law, concluded that, as a matter of Bermuda law, equal marriage is uh, required and therefore read the common law definition of, of marriage in a way in which accommodates same-sex couples to get married. You would have thought that any decent government that actually accepts the rule of law as the paradigm of the jurisdiction, not happy with the decision of a first instance court, will do the right thing, which is to appeal to the court of appeal. And eventually, if it loses again, appeal to the final court of appeal, which in the case of a real the privy council. But they did not. They said, well, you know what? The Human Rights Act, in which the court has based its decision, has an exemption clause. And that clause says that the local legislature could exempt the application of the Human Rights Act to any piece of legislation. So, let's pass the legislation so that the equality does not apply to the, human, to, to the marriage law and pass a legislation that actually complies with our international obligations, which basically says legal framework with same rights but different rights. Uh, that's the decision of the European Court of Human Rights. Not in that way, that are, what the European Court has said, that a legal framework is needed in place. You can call it whatever you want. Uh, and that's what they have done. But what's the problem with this? I mean, well, there's two problems. Uh, the first problem is, is one of uh, segregation, right? Uh, basically, if you want to put a parallel here, 
And we're going back to the Ferguson case in the United States in the 1880s. In that case, the Supreme Court of the United States said, uh, we are all equals under the law, but we will live all separate, right? So even if we accept that the Domestic Partnership Act of Bermuda provides the same right, it is actually creating a segregatory state which is in breach of the provision of discrimination of the Constitution of Bermuda. Now, the Constitution has not yet been used and probably is going to be used because now there are a claim that the new act in Bermuda is unconstitutional. And there is a hearing at the end of next month. But uh, what I would like to say is that the Bermuda Constitution has got a, a section 12 which prohibit discrimination. In fairness, does not include sexual orientation. However, uh, it is tried law like that even though sexual orientation is not amongst the grounds, uh, it should be read in unless it's expressly rejected, which is, of course, not rejected in the, in the Constitution of Bermuda. Right? The, the precedents are the Canadian Supreme Court, uh, Egan in 1995, where the court in interpreting the Charter of Rights, which is pretty restrictively written in Canada, does not contain sexual orientation. And then in 1995, the Supreme Court of Canada said, uh, well, if religion is included, which is a matter of choice, by all means, sexual orientation, which is like race or like gender, uh, a matter inherent to the person, has to be read and included in the Charter, even though it is not explicitly mentioned. And the European Convention on, uh, on Human Rights, the European Court of Human Rights, have followed similar interpretation <coughs> in relation to the provision of discrimination contained in the Convention. So it is the law that that section contains that provision. And by authorizing, by Boris Johnson authorizing to sign a local bill, which is at the very bottom of the pyramid, that is contrary to Section 12 of the Bermuda Constitution, has actually breached the provision of discrimination of the Constitution of Bermuda, and which is more serious. It has breached Section 2 of the Colonial Law Validity Act 1865. This law, by operation, this Bermuda law, by operation of the 1865 uh, legislation of the UK Parliament, is absolutely void and inoperative, in my legal point of view, in Bermuda. And it's more likely than not that this, the court in Bermuda will find out uh, that in. Uh, in, in, in May or whenever they issue a judgment on, on that case. So just to conclude, and just to, 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 to leave the floor for Peter, uh, the British overseas territories are not self-governing nations or states. Uh, they are not part of the Commonwealth of Nations. They, they lack the distinctive feature of self-governance. Uh, they are not, neither independent nor sovereign. The UK has equal powers to them. But those evolved powers, uh, which include self implementation, are constrained by legal uh, framework that have been set up by the UK itself to control and make sure that the international land and the responsibility towards the population are not breached. The, in answering, therefore, the question, is the UK fulfilling its role in protecting LGBT rights in British overseas territories and the Commonwealth? About the Commonwealth, I will leave Peter to, to answer that. But a, 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 about the British overseas territories, I think I have given you the law and sufficient examples to show that, uh, in principle, they are not. The UK happily adopts a policy of pointing a finger at Commonwealth nations that fail to secure LGBT plus rights and equality, when it has no legal power uh, or legal responsibility to bring about change. On the contrary, however, the UK seemingly turns its back on its own non-self-governing territories, where it has both the legal power and the legal responsibility to secure LGBT plus rights and equality, arguing instead, and inconsistently, that the British overseas territories are self-governing and even wrongly that the UK respect the will of the majority, but at the same time threatening them with direct rule or direct legislation in matters of tax, finance, and corruption. I would dare argue or finish in here that definitely LGBT matter is not a priority uh, for the UK government and the FCO. Uh, I can see here that 
something that is more scary from my perspective. There is a total disregard by the UK government of the rule of law. They just accommodate the, the, the interpretation and enforcement of the rule of law in a sort of fear in, in his British overseas territory to political convenience. This is a trend that is going on in many Western nations in, in, in the world, in Spain, in Venezuela, in the United States, uh, and it's a very scary uh, threat. Uh, we are suffering now in the British, British overseas territory the consequence of what I would refer uh, a disregard for the rule of law, and those are very scary. Thank you very much.